powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, where they're breaking down the opponents. We've got some questions on the text board for Football at Four. We'll throw Jeff Mosher's way here on the Sports Bash edition of Football at Four on a Monday. Uh, the Eagles getting ready for uh, they'll have their mini camps uh, in about eight days from now. Uh, a lot of teams are doing it right now. The Eagles will open up next week with their mini camps, and that was something I think, Jeff, uh, that the Nick Sirianni made a deal with the players, kind of that uh, they would cut down on their mini camps. Is that right? Last year, it's sort of a continuation of something that happened his first year as head coach when there was that sort of renegotiation between the league, the NFLPA, and the players. That was a, a more harmonious um, contract, right, uh, between the, t- the two organizations. There wasn't a huge lockout or anything. But part of that was, impacted the OTA schedule. And if you remember, Nick Sirianni um, and the players agreed. The, the players agreed that they would show up to a certain number of OTAs if – because remember, they're not contractually bound to, to go to any other than the mandatory ones, which are only, I think, three days' worth. So there was an agreement between Nick Sirianni and the players on a sort of revised schedule that the players accepted and the coaches would be happy with. And since then, they've sort of worked on a different schedule each year than the way the league puts it out or allows for. And it's not all just an agreement because they want to keep good relations with each other. A lot of it is also due to the um, new program, the strength and conditioning program that they have and uh, the guys that they brought over from the Rams and other organizations to really improve their conditioning. And they feel like this is the best way, you know, this, this also goes into the talk about uh, lesser hours of practice during training camp and OTAs and it all folds in. Um, And so far it's hard to argue with the results because they've stayed generally healthy for the last two years, especially when you compare that to the five or six years before. Uh, a Shaner from EHC texts in a question that I think is a, it goes right into your guys' podcast. Greg Cassell is breaking down the schedule with you guys on the latest edition of the Inside the Birds podcast. So, Shaner, I uh, uh, ask you to go listen to their breakdown here, but he wants to. The, he asked this question. I thought it ties in. He said, with the hard schedule and coming off an uncommonly healthy year, would you be surprised if this team was a 10-7 and seven or 9-8 and eight team and didn't win the division and they kind of eked in as a wild card, or are you not really concerned about them taking that big of a step back? I mean, I, I'm not that concerned because I still think they have one of their best, if not the best, offense in the NFL or right up there with Kansas City. I mean, they, they have so much experience returning on that side of the ball from last year's offense, and then you added – DeAndre Swift and Rashad Penny and Zacchaeus, you know, it's not like you lost a whole lot other than Miles Sanders. So I would think you would look at the additions and subtractions from the offseason on offense and say net positive, like they have a chance to be even better offensively, clearly defensively. I mean, they're, they're just completely rebuilt up the middle from linebacker safety and, and one defensive tackle. But I don't, you know, you know how it is in the NFL. If you can jump on teams early, um, then you sort of take your defensive weaknesses out of it because you make other teams one-dimensional, and the Eagles still have a really good pass rush, at least on paper. They should be very good, even without Javon Hargrave. By the way, what is it, six or seven first-round picks in the front and the defensive line by itself, which is pretty amazing. I don't know if any other team has that. So, um, I, st- I, st- so I don't think it's going to be like doom and gloom to the point where they should be a team that's worried about sneaking in and getting the sixth and seventh seed. I think they'll be considered the best team in the division. Uh, theirs to lose, although nobody has won this division two years in a row for 17 years, so they'll have to avoid that. But they are certainly poised to be able to do that. And if they do that, Mike, right, they're at least a top four seed. So I, I can't imagine, listen, the injuries, misfortune, they are playing a tougher schedule, so – that all folds in, but I still think this Eagles team on paper looks very good. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I want to get your you know take on this is the depth. If Last year, as that text message kind of said, they didn't have a lot of injuries, so the depth really wasn't challenged all that much. But do you look at last year's team as having more depth, or do you think this team has more depth? 
No, I think last year's team had more depth. I mean, um, especially at certain positions, like offensive line, you know, you were able to bring Andre Diller, the former first round pick off the bench. You were able to, you know, obviously with Isaac Sayamalu leaving, then, you know, you either have a rookie or, or a veteran like Jack Driscoll, who was good depth starting now, or maybe even, you know, someone else, if it's Cam Jurgens. Um, so I don't think there's deep on the offensive line, which is a big part of their success the last few years. Uh, defensive line depth is certainly a question, especially on the interior, you know, with Jordan Davis now going to be a starter and no Linval Joseph, no Ndamukong Sue, and you're really not sure what you've got after, you know, with Contavious Street, who's a newcomer, and Milton Williams is a nice player, but he's always been a bench guy, and, and Marlon Tuipolotu is fighting for his, his job with guys like Moro and Jomo. So there, there's question marks there, and of, of course, a linebacker, you know, last year they didn't need to because they stayed so healthy, but you had N'Kobe Dean if you needed to put him in a game. Now, you don't even know who's starting next to N'Kobe Dean and whether that player is going to be able to survive, you know, like having a starting job for, for 17 games. Um, same thing at safety. You've got some bodies there, but you don't really know how it's all going to shake out and what level of play you're going to get after, you know, really at any of the spots. I mean, Thurlman has been pretty consistently him, for five years. So I guess that's one guy, you know what you're getting, but after that, you really have no idea corner. You can make an argument. They're a little deeper because they do have a greedy, they have a veteran who's a backup outside corner, which they didn't have last year. So that's one spot where you might say, all right, with Ringo and with uh, Josh Job coming back, who played a little bit last year. And with Greedy Williams, at least you have his experience there on the outside, but most of those other positions I talked about, not as deep. Yeah, uh, and they, by the way, signed Nolan Smith today. You mentioned Ringo. He's the last guy, right? So uh, it would be great to get him yep. out there uh, competing for that spot because corner is a spot where they're going to need someone to step up. Theoretically, yes, because what are the odds that Bradbury and Slay play 17 games again, don't miss any time? You know, we know that Avante Maddox has been injured a lot, so if he gets hurt, you're going to need to find a slot corner who plays better than Josiah Scott did in his place last year. Jeff Mosher, Football 4 from InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast. You know, uh, the Eagles uh, knocked out the quarterback Purdy last year, then knocked out Josh Johnson. Well, today, the NFL's approved an emergency third quarter. I said the Eagles are like Wilt Chamberlain. They got a rule put in, but, you know, uh, this is a rule that should, you know, seemingly make sense to begin with here um, to to get that third quarterback to put on, uh, you know, They'll be active on game day, but it won't be a part of the 46-man active list, correct? Is that how that works? Yeah, which is sort of like, you know, this is what it used to be. When I first got into, you know, the job in 2005, that you had that. You had a inactive number three quarterback who could be used if you lost your first two quarterbacks. And then what the NFL did is say, let's kind of scrap with that, and we'll just give you that extra spot. Okay, and what teams wind up doing, including the 49ers, is using that extra spot on a different position. And now, and then they wind up crying about it when they lost two quarterbacks. So I feel like the league is sort of placating the criers who, you know, I'm not just, it's not just the 49ers. I think other teams have, have said it too, but it's like the NFL gave you that extra spot. You didn't have to not use it on a quarterback, you could have used it on a quarterback. It was your decision to go deeper at some other spot. Why are you now going back in time and reversing it because teams decided not to use that spot for a quarterback? I don't know. It just, to me, it's it's like fussing over nothing, but whatever. <laughs> well, we were talking about this earlier. Do you know where they have 53 men, but only 46 are active on game day? Where that number came from? Don't. No clue. Um, I'm just not that old. <laughs> Nor have I gone back in the history books to to look about why that number is the way it is. Right. So – um, we were we were kind of like why where where did randomly forty six come up as hey that's how many people dress on game day it's forty six and that's what it is who knows but now one of those guys will be the emergency quarterback so you really have forty seven uh, forty six dress one emergency quarterback and, and that will be that Jeff obviously um, because t- by the way of, of course Mike if the if the forty ers or any other team had been able to go to that third quarterback in a playoff game against the Eagles or another number one seed, for sure that third quarterback would have made a huge difference, right? I mean, you're talking like a Nate Sudfeld type of guy would have come in and just rescued the day. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, listen. This is all about. <laughs> you, you, uh, yeah, you, you, I said it's funny. Um, 
Like they they knocked out Purdy, they knocked out Josh Johnson, and like who would have been the third guy? Right? I, who, who even knows? Like that guy was just gonna go into Philadelphia and win a playoff game. Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> Sports Bash, uh, Jeff Bosher here, football at four. Obviously, you know, the Eagles don't get going until next week here, but I want to get your take on this division and where it sits as everybody else is kind of out there right now. Uh, let's start with Washington. Is Washington, mm-hmm. have they made enough strides this offseason to make, you know, to, to make you think that they have changed at all? No, and I know everybody's going to say, obviously no, because Sam Howell. I mean, who's Sam Howell? I actually think Sam Howell is going to be better than some, and I'm not sitting, sitting here putting any all pro or pro bowl on him. I just think that right now people look at Sam Howell and think this is a joke, but he should have gone higher in the draft based on a lot of people I spoke to going into the draft last year. And he's a kid who's got some talent. So it's not that I, I think that they're not going to meet or reach good expectations because of him, although he's clearly the number four quarterback in the division right now, but it's that year in and year out that team loses games because they don't have an offensive line for all that they put into their defense. And they have a very good defensive line and they really added to their secondary drafted a safety in the second round. Cam Curl's a good player. Got good corners, decent linebackers. We know they have great pass pass rushers, right? But they, 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 they go out and make a, a move to get the, the right tackle from the chiefs. Wiley, right? Who's, I mean, listen, but going into the Super Bowl, everybody thought that that was the, their weak spot for the chiefs. It just so happened that he didn't get beat. Guys were slipping all over the field, but the Washington commanders just don't upgrade their offensive line. And when they play teams in their division, like the Eagles and Dallas, they are constantly outclassed in the trenches and that, and they literally have to, to get lucky or run the ball and make, make some amazing plays like they did in the first game against the Eagles, where they had a couple of interceptions, three or four to win games. And it's just too much pressure on their run game and defense, they and and even their quarterback to to play try to win games with that offensive line. Yeah, uh, that's a good breakdown. It is you know this is a team, the Commanders, uh, that you know they have a new owner now. We'll see how that changes things for them. How far have the Giants come, in your opinion? To where you know where are they right now? They went to the playoffs last year. Now you know they're back uh, as they get ready for their mini camp here. Where is that team in your mind in the pan? Is that a team that made the playoffs because of the circumstances and take a step back, or do we think that team is taking a, another step forward? Well, that's a good question. I think they at least have a blueprint that's successful. You know, uh, you know, you can question how good. Daniel Jones is going to be or whether it was worth the money, but it's hard to find any quarterback. So the thing is you got to surround him with talent, right? Offensive linemen, like we just talked about with Washington, which they have, uh, you got to surround him with weapons. They have, uh, he's got some pretty good receivers. Uh, now, I mean, they have Wandale Robinson from last year. He's hurt all year, but he's a pretty good, pretty good receiver. They drafted Jalen Hyatt. They traded for Darren Waller. They'll have Sterling Shepard coming back. You know, hopefully their right tackle for them, uh, plays better in year two, just like their left tackle got better year after year after a rough first year. They drafted the Minnesota center, Schmidt. So they're doing – they drafted a very good cover corner in Deontay Banks from Maryland who's going to fit a Wink Martindale press man defense very well. So their blueprint, Mike, that they're following to me is one that ordinarily leads to success. They're bolstering their trenches, which they did last year and this year, and also getting playmakers for their quarterback and making the type of moves that make sense with their scheme – and their coaching staff. At the end of the day, you and I know, can they get enough, though, out of the quarterback? It's, to me, they'll be in games. Can they get enough out of their quarterback in the fourth quarter to win more than they lose and compete against New York and Dallas? That, to me, is the big question. Uh, and then there's Dallas. You know, there's a team that has constantly been – in the mix, in the mix, but disappointing come playoff time. But like that question asked before, did they have enough with the Eagles' schedule? You know, last year they had the, the, the first place schedule, and last year people said the Eagles didn't play anybody. Well, does Dallas have enough to scoop up enough regular season wins that they can, you know, with what they've done this offseason and where they are today? I, I like Dallas's offseason. I know nobody wants to hear that, and they think that you know everything the Cowboys do is a joke. And you know certainly the Cowboys' playoff record over the last twenty years speaks for itself. But what were their deficiencies? Why did Dak Prescott go from one of the least intercepted quarterbacks to the leader in interceptions last year? Well, he forced a lot of throws to receivers who were just not explosive. Michael Gallup was coming off the ACL; he wasn't himself. So they went out and traded for Brandon Cooks, who. Say what you want, gets a thousand yards every single year. Was it like eight years in a row? 
he's been a thousand yards. I mean, he's a good deep threat wide receiver that can be a nice weapon that they have along with, you know, the, their, their other wide receivers. And um, defensively, they went out and they've always struggled at that corner spot opposite digs. And they got Stephon Gilmore, who's not the Stephon Gilmore for 10 years ago, but he's better than the guys there, you know, the Anthony Browns or Jordan Lewis's or who, you know, Kelvin Joseph's that they were trying to fill that hole with. They are very deep at safety. They have good safeties. They have good linebackers. Mozzie Smith is going to sit next to uh, their other d- defensive interior linemen and, and probably play pretty well. And of course, they're going to turn Micah Parsons into an edge rusher full time now. I, I, look, I think that they are right there. As long as if Dak can fix his issues from last year and if Mike McCarthy's play calling winds up being better because it's a more traditional West Coast offense than, you know, what they were getting out of out of Kellen um uh Kellen Moore, right? Yep. Yeah, then maybe they will be the team that they're they've been supposed to be. They've obviously got to prove that. I'm just giving you what I see out of their fifty three and I'm telling you I think it's pretty competitive. Now if if they're held back by coaching or erratic quarterback play of course i don't think any of us will be surprised but the talent is there jeff mosher football at four check out the podcast it's out with a look at the eagles opponents and uh, obviously greg cosell breaks him down better than anybody else and of course jeff right here on football at four as we get ready for eagles minicamp last next week and boy the summer's cruising by it's not even started yet but football feels like it's moving 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 as always here on football at four Jeff Mosher in the house on a Mosher Monday. Mosh, appreciate it, bud. All right, my friend. Talk to you Wednesday.